Good afternoon, everybody. This is Greg Pesh, and I'm joined here with uh, Aaron Kolodny. We're partners with White and Case, which is uh, counsel to the Creditors Committee in uh, the Celsius Network bankruptcy case. Um, we're going to be uh, joined here uh, as well shortly by um, our co-chairs, Tom DeFiore and Scott Duffy, who uh, are coming up to the stage. Um, I appreciate it has been a very big week for Celsius in a number of respects. So um, before turning to the questions, we wanted to just give some opening comments um, about where a few things are to hopefully guide the conversation um, over today. And we're going to start off in a moment with my partner, Aaron, who will discuss the examiner's report, our work on that with the examiner and what we uh, have found so far in it. I know it is, uh, it is, it is shocking, some of the things that I'm sure all of you have read in it, and uh, we're focused on all of those same things. After that, after turn, looking at the examiner's report, which looks backwards in a sense, we're going to turn to the path forward in terms of the plan constructs that the committee is focused on, and we will also address the recent uh, so-called leak story as well. So um, with that, to, to start it off, um, I'll hand it over to my partner, Aaron, who can talk a little bit about um, the examiner's report and uh, our views on that and next steps for that. Aaron. Thanks. Um, so we, we got the report at the same time uh, that you guys had, and I've read I've read a good good portion of it, but but not the entire thing yet. Um, you know, we did participate in a lot of the investigation with the examiner, uh, or I, I would rather say alongside the examiner, uh, including sitting in on many of the interviews um, and asking questions uh, with them at those interviews. And, you know, we thought that was incredibly important uh, so that we could have our own independent view on what happened at Celsius. Uh, and we could assess the credibility of witnesses and make sure that we uh, that they are their testimony is consistent uh, when it's used later on. Um, you know, based off of what I've read so far um, and my experience in the process, I think the examiner did a great job. I think I think that this report is undoubtedly comprehensive. I think um, you know, based off of what I've read so far, it seems to be fair. Um, and it really captures, um, you know, what was happening behind the curtain. Um, and I can tell you, you know, while our group was initially hesitant about the cost of the report, um, you know, we're very happy that sunlight has been shined on what was happening behind the curtain at Celsius. Um, we think it's incredibly important that everyone is able to read it now and see it in black and white. Um, and that we can, you know, both deal with what happened in the past and start to look forward. Um, and I'll I'll be pretty blunt, you know, what Mr. Mashinsky and many members of his team did was wrong. Um, you know, Mr. Mashinsky lied. Um, they covered up a lot of his lies through editing videos, um, and they put themselves ahead of the company and they put themselves ahead of the account holders, more importantly. Um, you know, the examiner report goes through in a lot of detail how the price of sell was manipulated through market buybacks uh, and strategically purchased sell uh, transactions and how Mr. Mashinsky and many other insiders um, profited mightily off of that by selling their sell uh, through private wallets. Um, you know, I, I think it's important to note that whenever the UCC became aware of uh, some of the transactions that Mr. Mashinsky um, committed prior to uh, the bankruptcy filing, um, we were very strong and insistent that he be removed and the debtors and the special committee uh, listened to us and he was, uh, he did resign from Celsius. Um, you know, I think there's been a lot of confusion about whether this new co plan would involve um, anyone that participated in the conduct that's in the examiner's report. Uh, and I just want to be, you know, absolutely clear that there is no way we would let anyone 
or support anything where someone that was engaged in the conduct that's described in here would be allowed to control what's left of everyone's money that Celsius still has. Um, so, you know, I think, I think there, there's a lot to unpack in here. Uh, we are doing so. Uh, we are focused, uh, as I'm sure many government entities are, in holding Mr. Mashinsky and his co-conspirators accountable. Uh, and there certainly will be more to come on that soon. Thanks, Aaron. So, like I said um, at the beginning, it's Greg, um, the examiner's report is in a sense backward looking, but it does have some important uh, elements that will draw, uh, that, that will help us uh, decide the proper path out of bankruptcy here. So with that, um, I just want to talk really quickly about the plan process that's going on right now and uh, to sort of highlight and emphasize a few points that were made at the January 24th hearing and provide some context that I think is desperately lacking uh, from, you know, this uh, this leak situation last week. So just to just to take a step back here, um, you know, for most of the duration of the bankruptcy, you know, we have been hearing very regularly from account holders about what their priorities um, were for how to get out of bankruptcy. And we've been, we've been listening very carefully to that. And just to name a couple of big things here, you know, there's been obviously a need to establish a litigation trust to pursue Alex Mashinsky and some of the other founders. That is not controversial. That will be part of any Chapter 11 plan here. Second, uh, users have told us that they wanted to get uh, liquid crypto back, but then also have the ability to have a token uh, to capture some of the upside in the f equity upside, in a sense, using a token of the remaining non-crypto assets. Uh, third, um, you know, we have the benefit of being able to see how some of these other crypto bankruptcies have been unfolding in particular. You know, we are able to see, um, you know, the reaction in Voyager when it first selected FTX and when it selected Binance. And to, it, without putting it uh, too mildly, you know, the reaction that we heard from the user community was violently opposed to either of those parties being part of the Celsius process. So at, at the same time, though, we also looked at some of the uh, other issues, um, including some of the stuff that was relevant in the examiner's report. And in particular, as we were thinking about paths forward, we had to focus on the treatment of the sell token. Even before the examiner's report came out, the creditors committee was unified in its position that based on what we had seen, and this has been confirmed by the examiner, that there were significant problems with how sell was issued, how it was marketed, how it was used, how it was purchased. And as a result, we started to think that there would be a need to provide a different type of recovery, different form of recovery for sell. So that was also a big consideration here. Also, the, the loan book. Um, we need to, we, we were focused on how to provide a solution for the, the loans uh, in light of, you know, the different views about whether the collateral that the borrowers provided was actually collateral or whether it was property of the estate. And then finally, we wanted to have a, a solution that was either comprehensive, so it dealt with all of those issues plus mining, or it could be paired together um, with a solution to cover everything off. So um, based on that, you know, Celsius, uh, the special committee, Kirkland Ellis Center View, has been running a process with deep involvement by the creditors committee um, to contact investors about their interest in us. Uh, supporting a chapter 11 plan, you know, sponsoring it financially, providing management. Um, this creditors committee has also been reaching out on its own to people it thought would be of interest to be part of the process. And we involved many of those people in the process um, to, uh, to go into data rooms, make proposals, meet with management and whatnot. Um, you know, in recent weeks, that process has sort of started to reach its, its climax. And as uh, Kirkland previewed at the hearing on the 24th of late, you know, there's been a lot of attention focused on what we call the, the recovery co concept. And, uh, you know, in short, this is the concept where there would be a convenience class to provide a liquid crypto recovery to smallholders, the overwhelming number of users in the aggregate, but 
small holders, you know, something like upwards of 85% of the actual account holders. The remaining liquid crypto that is not used to provide recovery to those small holders would go into effectively a, a, a trust or recovery entity. That entity would issue tokens that could be held by the remaining, uh, you know, uh, larger investors that participated with Celsius. And um, those would be the intent would be that those tokens would be freely tradable uh, and track the value of the underlying assets. So you would have liquidity um, to sell out of those tokens if you wanted. Um, you know, at the same time, though, we as fiduciaries couldn't take any option off the table. So while we've been very focused on the recovery co concept, we've been running down a number of other options. In particular, um, you know, in recent weeks, there has been renewed interest in the mining business from outside parties. So at the creditors committee's insistence, the debtor has also been facilitating diligence and conversations with potential investors for the mining business so that the mining business could conceivably be uh, reorganized under a new management team uh, and the value of that, the equity of that provided to the account holders. And then in addition, um, you know, maybe in lieu of the uh, recovery co, we've been looking at possibly just uh, winding down Celsius or transferring the crypto to a third party uh, in the event that, you know, some of the challenges that we talked about at the hearing involving the Recovery Co., you know, the, the securities issues, the tax issues, other structuring issues, if those could not be um, achieved. So, you know, we've been, we've been going down multiple paths here for, for some time. And um, we're continuing to go down those paths. And uh, whatever path we take, though, it's going to be with a partner that has been identified in the marketing process. Even if it's Celsius filing the plan or even if it's the creditors committee filing a plan, the plan that's filed in this case will have a financial investor backer that was selected through the marketing process. And they're going to be the ones providing the juice for the plan to uh, go forward. And you know, to that end, no, no ultimate outcome here has been decided. But we felt it was important at the hearing to provide some context for what is going on um, in Celsius and with their marketing process. So with all that said, you know, we could talk about what, you know, until the examiner's report was sort of the 800 pound gorilla in the Celsius uh, universe, which is the, the so-called leak of alleged bid information um, on Substack uh, last week. Um, I know this is going to frustrate a lot of people that are listening. Um, I can't confirm or deny the information is accurate or if the parties are whomever were identified in the leak or who uh, the parties that have, I, have come at forward since December 20th and since the, the new year. I know that's frustrating, but we have NDAs. And the reason we have NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, confidentiality agreements, that is, is so that we can protect the integrity of the bid process. Every day, we, are, we and the debtors are providing public messages and private messages to potential investors about where they stand in the process. And the confidentiality of our communications with the bidders and the messages that we send them publicly and privately is very planned out and structured so that we can play different parties against each other and make sure we get last dollar for Celsius account holders, because the success of that process will determine recoveries here. Um, it's therefore regrettable that this leak happened. Um, for starters, uh, like I said, this leak is likely only going to reduce creditor recoveries because whether the information is accurate or not, it provides people that are still in the process to whom we are speaking every day with information about how things might or might not be unfolding. And that reduces the flexibility that the committee has in dealing with these parties to get the best possible outcome. It's particularly unfortunate that this has been monetized by the source of that leak for uh, publicizing um, her, her paid for content paid on Patreon. It's very unfortunate that we are now dealing with that type of situation, given the effect it could have on the creditor recoveries. All that being said, um, we are working very hard to make sure that we can choose a path as quickly as possible and get this bankruptcy over. Um, we're trying to mitigate the effects of that leak. Um, we're investigating the source of the leak with the debtor and the United States trustee. 
and you know if there was any information provided by the debtors inadvertently to the media those sources will be uh will be found out um and finally, I just want to also pinpoint, just highlight something here, which is that irrespective of whether this leak happened or not, the information about the bidders has already started to become public by the debtors in a controlled way and the committee in a controlled way. And as part of the plan voting and confirmation process, that information we put out there because creditors have a right to know how much the bid on the table is worth relative to the option. So we were always planning to have that information out there. But again, it was after we had a signed deal, which we do not today, and after we had run the whole process and selected the, the outcome. So with, with those opening um, comments, you know, I know there's a lot of um, questions. Yes, Frank, and before you go and, on, you know, one, one thing I wanted to say is, as Greg mentioned, you know, we may be limited in how much we can talk about the different bids or even concepts that are described in the leaked information. Um, because we take our confidentiality restrictions and our legal restrictions, you know, really seriously. And, and they're there for a reason. And if you don't, then you lose credibility, both with the parties that you sign those restrictions with and, and as an individual. Um, but we are here to listen. And, you know, to the extent we're not able to answer specific questions or discuss specific topics, you know, one of the things we are able to do is to listen to all of the comments that you all have so that we can take those into consideration uh, when when we're all deciding what to do. Um, and our two co-chairs are on the uh, are on the the um, this chat. Uh, I think a couple other members of the committee are on as well. Uh, and we take. You know, they all take their responsibilities and listening to you all uh, extremely seriously. So while we might not be able to answer every single question, we are listening to every single person. And that's, you know, we view that as a key part of our job. Right. So, um, you know, with that, I see there's already a lot of hands raised. So um, like we did at the last um, the last session, um, we're going to have people ask a question and we're going to take them off stage. We don't want to show any implied favoritism towards any party here. Um, we're going to try to get to as many people as possible. And um, with uh, that, why don't we um, start with, uh, let's see someone who hasn't really spoken here um, in the past before much. All right. I'm going to go start with Bradley. So Bradley MCK 67, I'm going to recognize you. So, uh, Bradley, or Brad, uh, how are you go? Um, why don't you introduce yourself and then um, ask your question? <laughs> Thanks for letting me out. Um, yeah, I'm a I'm a creditor in the in the earn um, program. The question that I have for you is that um, kind of early on, you mentioned that um, you you assured us that um, no one who was involved in the in the actions described in the examiner's report will be involved in the company moving forward mm -hmm. um, to put a firmer point on it um who is defining what the path forward is meaning who was involved in rejecting the bids and who is kind of putting together the, the reorg plan, as we say. And were any of those people involved in the post-bankruptcy problems that the examiner complained about? I'm reading a number of things where the examiner is saying that they had um, difficulty retrieving records when they were requested. They had numerous cases where they were asked for original records and were provided with records that were produced for the sole purpose of responding to the request. There's a lot of stuff that the examiner encountered <clears throat> with current employees that, yeah. you know, obviously were to, <laughs> trying to, the sole purpose of which was to, to block the examiner's efforts. Are those people the people who rejected these bids are those people, yeah. the people who are plotting a way forward. 
Yeah, let me let me start, and I, I'm I'm probably gonna. I appreciate you asking the question, Bradley. I'm probably gonna sound like a broken record today, but the 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 assertion that the bids have been rejected is just categorically false. The Recovery Co. investor we're dealing with came to us through the process. The people we're dealing with on the other paths are all from the sale process, the marketing process. So the bids have not been rejected. What we're telling you is that there's only so many hours in the day and that we are focusing on particular ones that we think are more promising and more likely to be achievable. So the bids have not been rejected. That's just wrong. And I hope I can disabuse people of that incorrect notion today. You know, as to who's going to be choosing the bids, look, the outcome of this case is going to run through the community. Um, the, the plan is only going to happen if the community has, if there's sufficient support among the community. So the creditors committee is a fiduciary for all the users. So we've been trying to channel your interests and your, your priorities um, to the debtor to implement in the plan. And like we said, if the debtor for some reason does not support what we think is that the will of the overwhelming number of the community members, you know, we're ready to take it in a different direction. Um, the special committee is the one, you know, that oversees the debtors efforts here. They have their own advisors. Alex Mashinsky is not part of that. He's been, you know, he's been, uh, you know, uh, removed from the company. And, um, I think as we digest the examiner's report, I know what the debtor has told us they plan to do and what we plan to hold them accountable to doing is we're going through the report and trying to find any references to people that were involved with the prior bad acts. And we're going to try to understand what they did. And if if it's appropriate to remove people, we're not afraid to tell the debtor or seek other relief from the court to make sure those people are not there. Um, because if they did bad things or didn't participate in the report, um, the examination, that is, they shouldn't be at Celsius. They shouldn't be getting a paycheck. Um, so that's going to be something I think we turn to right away is making sure we can clean house if there's any uh, stragglers or bad apples at the company. And then with respect to the specific mentions of, of documents that weren't provided and, you know, that sort of thing, I, I read that portion of the examiner's report, um, you know, we've we've experienced it as well, um, you know, documents being a lot of them dumped all at once, um, you know, things that people, um, you know, said existed that might not exist in the way that they have. And it's hard to tell whether it is a product of very poor record keeping from the company in the periods prior. For instance, I know the examiner mentions a number of spreadsheets and they just don't really line up. Um, you know, that, that may be because the company was just very poorly managed. I mean, one thing that comes out through the whole examiner's report is a lack of processes at this company. Um, you know, the other part uh, might be a lot of professionals trying to struggle with those poor records to get them together. Uh, it doesn't change what the examiner is saying or the tone of it. But sitting here today, you know, we don't have reason to believe that, that you know, this is someone trying to, to orchestrate some post-bankruptcy cover-up. Uh, instead, it is a product of very poor record-keeping trying to piece things together and the examiner having a really good team uh, to try to do that on their own. And I think yeah. that, you know, they were facing a very tight deadline. They got a lot of documents very late. Obviously this is a monster amount of information to wade through. And I think they did a really good job in doing it. And I think if you gave them another month, you know, they would probably have been able to solve a lot of those problems and follow up. It's just a question of timing. Yeah, and going back to the outcome here, look, we we view it as important to have the examiner's report in hand before a plan is proposed. And, you know, we're at risk of sort of making, um, you know, the perfect, the enemy of the good here because we, we need to move forward. And um, the examiner was comfortable issuing her report. If she wanted another extension, I'm sure she could have asked for it. She didn't. She did ask for prior ones. So, but, you know, to Aaron's point, look, it's unacceptable if anyone was holding back documents. We're going to go through the report, make sure that no one who's still there was involved in that way and uh, make sure there's a, you know, a good number of people or the people that are there, are, you know, have clean hands 
and weren't involved in any kind of misconduct, whether producing the report or beforehand. So, and I don't want it to seem like we are making excuses for Celsius or whatever. That's not what we're trying to say. I'm just trying to explain to you what I yeah. what I see when I read stuff yeah. like that. So, anyway. yeah, you're 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 not coming across that way. Just for my from my view, I, I I like the answer that you've given. Along the same lines. Um, what is Kirkland and Ellis's role in deciding the plan to move forward? And I ask this question not because I think that Kirkland Ellis is a bad actor, but the fact of the matter is they were selected by people who are bad actors. And they are, you know, their number one, as any law firm, their number one goal is to please their client. Do they have any role in uh, in the reorg? Yeah, the, they represent they represent the the debtor. Sorry, one second. Public announcement in the space we're in. Um, sorry for that. Um, they represent the debtor. Um, they're rep, you know, the special committee that is overseeing the process on their end. Um, the, you know, so we talk to them every day. They have views about the sale process. We have views. Um, and they're representing, you know, the debtor in that regard. Um, you know, I, I know that they I know that they were, in a sense, indirectly chosen by Alex. And we all know how we all feel about Alex. You know, that said, um, candidly, Kirkland has a, a lot more uh, to lose here by messing this up and doing Alex's bidding, even if he was trying to do their bidding. Um, and uh, if we have no reason to think or expect Kirkland would be doing Alex's bidding. You know, they were helpful in, with us getting him kicked out of there. Um, and, you know, I don't want to make this about Kirkland, but if there's any party at the company that's doing anything that we think is for the bidding of Alex, you know, we're going to make sure the court knows and, and get them I mean, get that address because we can't have this process delayed or tainted. So. Anyway, Bradley, I um, appreciate you asking the questions. I know there's a lot of others, so I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to bump you here, but I appreciate you coming today and uh, we'll talk to someone else. Um, all right. So, uh, all right. I promised Danny Frischberg last night that I would call on him. I see that he's raised his hand. So Danny, I'm going to call on you now. All right. Um, all right. That's so thank you. Danny, um, when you're ready, go for it. Yes. Uh, my question is, could you please explain um, what, or the cram down, uh, cramming down a, a plan is, and will the UCC oppose it if the debtors try to use the cram down? Sure. Thanks for the question. Um, for the the benefit of everyone listening in that don't know the re the meaning of that term, one of the key benefits of the bankruptcy process is that um, a a company that's in bankruptcy, the debtor, you know, it separates its creditors into different classes based on being similar to each other so for example secured creditors get put in one class trade vendors get put in another class you know uh bondholders get put in another class and the cram down that danny is mentioning is a power under the bankruptcy code to so-called cram down a plan on a dissenting class so for example if the bondholder class were to vote no or in this i'll, I'll make it about celsius if the, if the loan class were to vote no his question is, can the earn class or the custody class or the whatever other class, convenience class, be used to cram um, down the, uh, the dissenting class? Um, you know, our, our goal here is to have a plan that's accepted by each of the different constituencies here, so each of the different classes. Um, it'll be really troubling, I think, if we try using different classes to, to jam and cram others. Uh, I can't speak with certainty if that's never going to happen. For all I know, Danny, you're, you might support a transaction where we have to use it, but it's not something to be taken lightly. And it's, it's quite complicated and costly and involves litigation. So it'd be our goal to avoid that and have a plan that's supported by all the different um, constituencies if possible. And just to, to add one more thing to that. So the, the default under the bankruptcy code is every every class of creditors has to vote in favor of the plan. And that is 
means that two thirds of the amount of that class and half of the number of creditors in that class have to vote yes. What, what Danny's referring to and Greg spoke about, about cram down, is what happens if you have an impaired accepting class that votes yes, but certain other ones that vote no. And in that case, you can cram the plan down and get it approved by the bankruptcy court. But to cram a plan down, you have to meet um, legal requirements, including that the plan be fair and equitable um, to the class that's voting no. And so there's a, a the litigation Greg is referring to is the the litigation that would occur from a dissenting class that says this plan is not fair and equitable to us because one, it's either not giving us as much as we would receive in a liquidation, or two, it is improperly uh, treating other classes to benefit them at the expense of us. Yeah. So, Danny, hopefully that answered your uh, question, and uh... that does. May I ask one more? Um, um, sure. Thank you. It's uh, it's the elephant in the room, and I'm sure everyone's been asking about it. But will the UCC uh, commit to opposing uh, the exclusivity, uh, ending it, or at the very least expanding it to include the UCC and potentially other uh, parties in it? Yeah. Look, our our statement from before is our statement from before. Exclusivity ends on uh, February fifteenth. The debtor is on the shot clock to pres to present to us and agree with us on a path forward by then. If uh, we don't reach an agreement, you know, we're ready to move in a different direction. And, uh, you know, we would, we would welcome the ability for the UCC to, uh, to be able to file um, its own plan if the debtor is not playing ball with us. So our, our statement is what our statement is. We want them to, to come to terms with us. And if not, we're ready to move in a different direction. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Danny. Uh, I'm going to boot you from the stage here. Um, all right. Uh, next, um, let's see someone who I might have, have called on as much uh, in the past. Um, all right. Uh, I'm going to call on uh, Mary Delgado. So, Mary, when you hear us, why don't you introduce yourself and then ask your question? Um. Hey there, thank you so much for um, for the update um, on everything. Um, actually, my question was uh, what Daniel had asked, so thank you for um, answering that. And I didn't introduce myself. My name is Mary. I'm in earned custody loans, equity, sell, you name it, I'm in it. <laughs> um, since you were talking about cram downs, um, how is that in relation to like the convenience class and the impaired class, you know, as it relates to votes? Yeah, I think, um, you know, Aaron can jump in here too, um, but I – if 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 there's a convenience if there is a convenience class and by the way the convenience class doesn't only ex necessarily exist in the recovery co concept it could exist if we transfer the accounts to a buyer or we wound down the company or did something else i mean it 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 could exist in any number of formats but um if there was a convenience class that voted yes by 66 and 2 thirds in amount and 50% by number and then there was another class, um, say the the, uh, uh, the the loan class. I'm just making it up. You know, under some circumstances, that uh, the uh, the convenience class, which isn't getting paid in full in cash, could be used to drag along the loan class. In my example, um, but I want I, I think I think there might be some confusion here because I think I saw this in some of the YouTube videos or something. You know. There's an estimate that, you know, people in the convenience class, based on what Kirkland said last week, would receive 70 percent recoveries. Um, and 70 percent is more than 66 and two thirds. So people sort of speculated, oh, the convenience class is going to be used to, you know, drag along, you know, the other earned people or something like that. Um, you know, we're very cognizant to that. Um, we don't want, you know, any class to be to have to be used in that way. Um, unless there's really good reason. So uh, we're, we're, we're very cognizant of efforts to sort of uh, jerry-rig the voting process in that way. So I appreciate that might be a little bit more, but is that helpful, Mary? Yes, it was. Thank you so much for answering my question, and thank you so much for uh, holding these um, town halls. They're very helpful to us. I hope you do more of them. Thanks, uh, Mary. All right. All right. Uh, next, uh, I'm going to call... Eric Answerman, the 
with the gel cell image. So, Eric, when you're uh, ready, why don't you introduce yourself and ask your question? Uh, yeah, I, I've been in and out, so I didn't. So I apologize if I haven't been paying attention. I'm not sure if you answered the question or not as to whether or not you're pursuing retail clawbacks and if you've made a definitive, you know, come to a definitive decision as to whether you guys are going to do that or not. Yeah, it's a really great question. Um, so, look, the the company has. Uh, a whole of, you know, whatever, two or two and a half billion dollars that they're short crypto. Um, what's going to go to fill that hole? The mining business, you know, the litigation trust, um, there's still going to be a pretty significant hole. So we're looking at options to fill that. You know, as fiduciaries, we have to look at the preference issue, um, but it's something that we're considering very carefully. Um, and, you know, I don't know if these types of numbers have been, you know, shared before, but I, I think it's important for the user community just to kind of understand, you know, the, the splits here. But, um, you know, if you look in the preference period, there were um, something like uh, $4 billion of withdrawals done. You know, 72% of those um, were uh, for, uh, I'm sorry, the overwhelm. Uh, I'm sorry, 77% uh, of those were for people that were like, you know, um, over a million dollars. So, uh, you know, the very large swag of those is for like a very small subset. So as the community, as the UCC looks at the issue, we're really cognizant that this could be do a lot of damage to the reorganized business. We have to we have to address the clawbacks, but it would be our expectation that they would affect if if at all, which is a big if because the buyer investor might have their own views. But, you know, at the high end, you know, the super high net worth large withdrawals, you know, that might be a meaningful source of value. So that's something we're considering. But we don't we don't think that it should apply to small holders who had, you know, de minimis amounts. We're looking at the the big high net worth individuals that were taking out, you know, significant sums. Um, and um, we appreciate it's a very, con you know, controversial issue and I'm sure you have views on it. But um, that's what we're looking at to try to fill the hole. So I guess so. Two questions to add to that. So, does it? I'm sorry, Eric. If you can hear us, you you went in and out there. Um, all right, um, Eric. If you can hear us, uh, I think we might have lost you. So, I'm gonna. If you raise your hand again, I'll, or if someone knows Eric, why don't you tell him? We'll call him again if he raises his hand, but I think we lost him. Uh, oh, maybe you're back. Eric, you still there? Yeah. Okay, sorry. I, I missed you. You said you had two questions. Yeah, it was very quickly, two questions. It's, it sounded like you're, you're, you may be pursuing or potentially pursuing a tiered clawback uh, structure based on, based on amounts of what was taken out within the clawback period. Is that an accurate uh, assessment? Yeah, look, to be clear, we haven't made a decision one way or the other, but I think we're looking at it in a few different ways. One is I think we're really focused on the amounts and particularly high, you know, large, large withdrawals during that 90 day period. Second, you know, we're trying to parse that 90 day period based on what was going on in the market. So for example, you know, we're looking at, does it make sense to have a dividing line between pre Terra Luna and post Terra Luna or, you know, other kind of news involving Celsius. So it's kind of a matrix of those different considerations that we're trying to drill down on. Yeah. Uh, I, I, ap I appreciate your response for me. I, I just, as a U.S. citizen, I just don't understand. I, I don't understand how, we as you like you or whoever is part of that process would be able to claw back anyone who's not based in America. And quite frankly, anyone who's not in custody, meaning whatever the estate doesn't currently have in its possession. I'm not sure how you guys are what the process is of clawing those assets back. And for me, it just seems like it would be unfairly distributed against custody uh, versus trying yeah. to claw back for God knows how long other assets across the world. Uh, I just don't know how that process takes place. Look, I, that's a really fair question. We want to make fun, look fundamentally. We want to we, we want this process, the whole process, the plan process and each aspect of it to be fair. We don't want it to fall disproportionately on one group of people, particularly if there's a geographical nationality reason to, you know, for that to be there. 
Um, so that's something we're, we're, we're considering. We don't want it just to be like U.S. earned people getting hit by it, for example, and international people. As to how you would actually effectuate it, um, look, the company's going to make distributions. You know, those distributions could be offset against preference exposure, potentially. And then just uh, if there's big, uh, you know, judgments or whatever that the company wants to pursue afterwards, you could go do that, you know, uh, going around the world, much like you've seen in like, you know, the, the Madoff or the Lehman Brothers type situations where they try to track down these things using banking records and whatnot. Um, so it is possible. But look, again, we don't want it to fall disproportionately on people who can't pay today and would be unduly hurt by it. And we don't want there to be kind of unfairness based on where people live or other kind of arbitrary criteria. Like like custody. That would be arbitrary, correct? Uh, I don't I don't really quite follow the question, but look, we, we don't want people to we, we, we're not trying to single out individual people. We're trying to be fair in looking at this very complicated emotional issue. So fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, Anyway, Eric, I appreciate you dialing in. I'm glad you got back to us here. I'm going to I'm going to boot you here just so I can go uh, let someone else up here. But appreciate you coming today. Um, all right. So. Uh, uh, Celsius loans, I'm going to recognize you. So uh, Celsius loans or uh, why don't you introduce yourself and ask your question? Hey, Greg. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for hosting the space as always. Yep. We're the uh, Celsius Loans ad hoc group of borrowers represented by David Adler. I know we've worked constructively together. Uh, we've tried to work constructively with the debtor uh, just as a way to move forward. Obviously, David Adler listening in on the call. We've obviously tried to avoid any type of litigation. We'd like to obviously continue to avoid litigation. I know, Greg, you've alluded to an intercreditor rivalry that we do not want to litigate. We want to mediate and negotiate between earn, between custody, between loans. And I know you've also met, uh, mentioned this idea of competitors. And as I know, as you know, uh, be able to discuss later in the week um, with uh, solvent lending platforms that are currently operating in the U.S. that have all the appropriate licenses that the ad hoc group of borrowers, if they want to exit the estate, what, from a negotiation standpoint with earn what that is going to look like. And I think there's any fair number of proposals. And as you've mentioned probably before, there's a, a legal determination of whether that collateral belongs to the estate, whether it is or is not part of the estate and whether that principle is or is not uh, part of the estate. Obviously we have what we believe. And again, we would, we want to stress the ad hoc group of borrowers does not want to litigate this in court. We do not want to get into the intricacies of the bankruptcy code as exciting as it is. <laughs> we don't want to be a part of that. We yeah. want in a fruitful discussion, obviously with Thomas, with Scott, with yourself, and as well with the debtors, we want to reach an amicable solution that allows ad hoc borrowers, anyone that elects to be a part of a deal, or if not, be a part of whatever the debtor's plan is. And, and there, there's going to be give and take. Everyone has to have some form of haircut that's fair to all. And at, at the end of the day, I, I don't want there to be an intercreditor rivalry. There's tons of people with loans that are also have earn accounts. So you can't pit you know, yourself against yourself. So I just want to stress, we do not want to litigate. We want to figure out wh what it, where can we all meet in the middle of the Venn diagram and, and allow people that do want to exit without having their loan liquidated or experiencing a set off um, and what that looks like going forward. And I know that doesn't happen yeah. obviously in Twitter bankruptcy court or Twitter spaces. So I, thanks for, thanks for the yeah. time. Thanks for having me on stage. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll um, <laughs> let me, uh, Thank you for for uh, for raising your hand today. Um, so, just for those listening at home, just to kind of parse some of this because some of it might not be uh, you might not be familiar with all the circumstances. But the uh, the committee, the committee and the debtor have uh, been talking with the loan group. We uh, Judge Glenn told us at the last hearing, you know, he wanted to see us resolve the matter. Um, we've been talking among ourselves, amongst ourselves about different ways we could try to consensually resolve it. 
and try to find a fair way to deal with loans. Um, you know, the the ball is uh, kind of uh, on our side of the the, the net right now with uh, the committee and the debtor talking about a particular you know series of constructs and ideas, and uh, we're going to talk continue talking with the uh, loan group, much as we are committed to talking to the other groups. And I hope I share the hope that we will uh, resolve it and not have to have litigation because that just is more um, money out of your pockets and into the pockets of the professionals. And uh, we want to minimize the cost of this process. So anyway, I appreciate you raising it today and I'll, uh, I'm going to boot you and go to the next person. Yep. Thanks, Greg. Um, all right. All right. So, um, Requests. I'm going to call on uh, John Dimitros. So, John, when you're uh, ready, why don't you introduce yourself and ask your question? Thank you, Greg, for having me, my, my brother from Chicago. Um, this is going to be a very specific question to custody. We know that pure custody and custody under a certain threshold uh, have been ruled to be released, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm stating that correctly. So we know that those, those two forms of custody will be uh, released from the estate. My question to you is, what does the UCC think about uh, dirty custody, so to speak, that is over the $7,500 or $7,600 threshold? Um, so I think, I think that those positions, and this is Aaron, I, I think that- Oh, Aaron, Aaron, I'm sorry. I thought it was- No, no, it's fine. I, I was just, I wanted to make it clear who was talking so that- uh, Apologies. Right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as we, as we said in our, um, as we said in our briefs and the debtors did and we heard in court, those amounts, um, you know, we believe are subject to preferences. And, um, you know, I think on the other side, Kyle made his point very clear that, that he believes that there are valid defenses to those preferences. And like the loan group, I think to the extent that we're able to work out um, some sort of compromise uh, that would allow, um, you know, for a settlement of that, and that settlement would be available to everybody, who's in custody, uh, I think that is the best case scenario. Um, but to the extent we, we are not able to, uh, we set up a framework in which we can um, discuss, you know, how to, how to litigate the issues so that if, if, you know, custody is right and we are wrong, those amounts can be distributed or uh, vice versa. If, if, if we are right and custody is wrong, um, then they can get the treatment afforded to earn creditors. I would think that that settlement could be implemented in a plan. It could be implemented uh, apart from a plan. Um, and, you know, as I said before, I, I think that that settlement would be available if, if reached would be available um, to any custody holder. It wouldn't be uh, just made available to uh, the ad hoc groups or anything of that nature. A follow up on that. You, you guys threw out an interesting statistic that within the 90 days, uh, before Celsius declared bankruptcy, approximately 70 some percent, uh, 77 percent of those withdrawals were one million dollars or more. So is it wrong of me to assume that the, the cutoff, if, if you were able to achieve uh, rights to preferences, would there be uh, a cutoff that, that obviously the, 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 the UCC would be, a minimum cutoff that, that, that you would be looking to, uh, you know, pursue or litigate. So to be clear, I mean, you're not going to go after people that have $20,000 balances, so to speak. If there's guys on the table or men or women that have a million dollar plus, so uh, a million dollars. Yeah, I guess let me let me answer in, in two different two different things. First of all, it's not the UCC that would be uh, pursuing any of those actions or determining what is to be pursued. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. we're a fiduciary for unsecured creditors. And in that regard, we have uh, an obligation to take a position which is in the best interest of all unsecured creditors. Um, how 
that would typically work is those claims would be preserved in a plan and then could be pursued by a post-confirmation litigation trust that would be, it, it, it would kind of, you know, seek to claw back amounts or otherwise. Um, after All right. And that's, you know, subject to whatever considerations the purchaser had and that whether that plan is confirmed or not would be subject to a creditor vote. Um, Ten I think that, that that's it. That's all yeah, I, 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 I appreciate. I want to I want to just add one one thing. You know, Greg mentioned that one million dollar dividing line. Um, you know, like lots of things when you're looking at big numbers, I think one million dollars is a nice round number, right? He's not. Greg's not saying we would pursue anything over one million dollars. As, as I said before, it wouldn't be us, but that the estate would pursue everything over one million. He's not pursuing saying that you wouldn't pursue anything under one million. There's a, a calculation of expense to benefit and to uh, the merits of any legal action that goes into any uh, prosecutor or lawyer that's seeking to bring yeah. actions. But I, yeah, I think that the key point here, and John, I appreciate you asking the question, is just this whole preference thing. You know, it's it's a very small number of people that have the overwhelming piece of the exposure. So we're looking at it from that prism. Um, can I can I just ask, and you, you probably can't answer this question. I'm going to ask anyways. Do you think that a percentage of those people, especially the high net worth individuals, I, I, could be deemed insiders? Yeah, that's a good thing. Um, good thing to raise. I, I probably didn't say this before. Um, whatever happens with preferences generally, you know, insiders are a different story and, you know, those are going to be vigorously pursued. Um, so, you know, whenever people talk about like, is something going to happen with retail preferences or custody, th there's like a whole separate bucket of insiders. We want to vigorously pursue those. And I expect, yeah, some of those are probably, you know, insiders, um, that, don't deserve to get a clean bill of health um, at the end. So, and, and John, there's a there's a definition of insider in the bankruptcy code um, that specifies yeah, the people that are insiders, and then the mm -hmm. concept of non-statutory insider, which broadens mm -hmm. that to a, a slightly wider group. And so, you'd have to look at each person to see whether they fit within either of those definitions to know whether your preference period is 90 days or a year prior to the bankruptcy. Ah, uh, that makes and, sense. Insiders a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and what the sense. preference no period does is it creates a presumption of insolvency. And so that mm -hmm. by saying you're an insider, that presumption of insolvency goes back further because the thought is that those people had a better idea of the financial condition of the company. And so you should look for a longer period of time before that to see whether they are, whether they did take amounts off or receive a transfer that gave them more than they would have received if they didn't know that and if they stuck around for the bankruptcy. Got it. Yep. Got it. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. I know there's, there's probably a lot of questions. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thanks, John. Stay, uh, stay warm in Chicago. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. So next here, uh, why don't we um, go to uh, Joe Lair, JSL Ventures. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself and ask your question, Joe, when you're ready. Hi, a uh, couple of quick questions. Um, do you know if Celsius is planning to issue 1099s for 22? Uh, my understanding is that for yield generated in 2022, they would do that in or sometime in February. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I I don't candidly, I don't think Aaron or I have the further detail there, but we could put out a message about it once we verify it. But I, that was my understanding. And that, uh, just commentary, that would, that would put uh, people in a major hardship, you know, not having coins after having earned them when the coins were worth a lot more. So you could be, you know, uh, paying taxes on, on uh, coins that were given, earned, okay. so when it was, you know, very uh, high in price and, and now we don't have them all together. So is there a way, I mean, I think there would be enough basis to uh, make the case, uh, Celsius to make the case that it really wasn't earned at the end of the day and that it wasn't uh, a yield, it was more like a, a hedge fund. Um, is there a way for the UCC to make that argument that they should not be issuing 1099s? We'll definitely look into it. I don't know, standing here today, what the options are, but um, we've gotten a question a lot recently, so we're trying to look into it. 
Okay. Yeah, I think it's a huge issue. Uh, next question. Um, it seems like the plan that was kind of leaked and, and the, the little bit that was put out by Celsius uh, implies that the, there is a serious consideration. Hi, Joe. You um, broke up there when you started the plan that Celsius put out. Can you can you start over? I missed the – you broke up. Yeah, sorry. Sorry about that. I got a call. Okay. Um, so, you know, it seems like now the serious consideration to actually – take um, possession of the coins and give it to the reorg and not just, uh, you know, give access to those coins to people and put all the illiquid assets into uh, something that may generate, you know, a better return over time. I'm mm -hmm. just wondering, I, mean, I know there's a limit how much you can say, but like what would be a scenario where that you can see that would make sense for creditors to risk the other 50% of their assets? I mean, are we talking about a plan that's so mind blowing that's going to change the industry with some amazing partnership. Um, do you see that as like something that you're going to get be able to get enough buy-in or are we kind of just wasting our time? Um, well, I think the whole, you know, whole purpose of today is, and, and just every day really is we want to get your feedback. So, you know, we want to hear how people view that recovery co construct, but yeah, the gist, the gist of it would be that, you know, while you don't get your coins back, the goal is to have the tokens trade at, close to asset value so that, you know, you could ride the upside or if you don't want to, you know, you could trade, you could sell them and uh, essentially, you know, cash out um, without getting liquid crypto. That's the goal um, to make it work. I think we need to, to and, and again, this isn't the only option. This is just, this is one that we've focused on a lot based on what people have told us about some of the other people in the market and their preferences for the whole the, the whole deal. Um, but, uh, you know, we need to make sure the, the, the investor we're speaking to is highly reputable with a track record. Um, this wouldn't be a new venture for that person. Um, we would need to make sure that, you know, the, the right controls there in terms of governance so that if things went sideways, the creditors could sort of step in, um, through their, the board of directors, you know, could step in and, and sort of end it and move in a different direction. Um, we need to consider a lot of different issues in that respect um, before we, uh, you know, even if it only is for a small subset of the holders, um, you know, before we, uh, you know, propose something like that. What do you think, Joe? I mean, I, I think, um, first of all, there's also a, a huge um, tax implication with that. And again, uh, if you're talking about a, a token that encompasses all the assets, including the, to the coins, you could be putting people in a position where they have to unload those coins to pay taxes because now, you know, it's a taxable event mm -hmm. and you're basically, um, you know, either t t taking a choice of putting at risk that 50% th of coins that you have in something that's illiquid or you're being forced to sell to pay taxes, in which case, you know, people could end up with a much lower amount. Now, I'm, I'm open-minded, you know, if, if yeah. you're talking about a partnership with e Elon Musk and, and they have some major <laughs> you know, crypto breakthrough plan, I'm all for it, you know, uh, you only yeah. live once, right? But um, I'm just wondering, you know, if it's a good partnership, like why couldn't they, and they have a good business plan, why couldn't they go with kind of ethos that we've had from the beginning of this process, which is, you know, give people back custody of their coins and give them the option to stay um, and incentivize them to stay by getting, you know, more equity or earning back slowly the coins mm -hmm. that are missing. Um, but then the people that leave, you know, are taking the haircut and, and leaving. Um, I, I think, you know, with a good partnership that, you know, it's a little bit less simple than just tokenizing everything into one token. But um, yeah. I, I just see, you know, unless it's some crazy uh, scenario that we're not thinking of, it would be very hard to get buy-in. Uh, yeah, so that's why we want to. Yeah, so uh, first off, um, I think you hit the nail on the head. The tax issue you identified is one of the the key concerns that we have with any type of recovery co concept. Um, for the benefit of those that want to understand that, um, essentially, depending on how the recovery co might be structured, you know, distributions that you get of the tokens could be taxable, and um, you would need to pay tax on that. And then later on, you know, the recovery company, like any public company would be a corporation. So it's, you know, probably has to pay tax on, uh, you know, future earnings and growth. So um, that's something we're trying to navigate and figure out, you know, what works and doesn't work. 
Um, you know, Joe, as to your other point, look, I, again, um, we need to make sure that the people that we're talking to about the investor, um, the investor that we're talking to, you know, can meet muster with the regulators and more importantly with the community. And that, you know, putting the, the, the liquid stuff, the liquid stuff and, and maybe the mining, maybe not the mining um, into that structure could generate, you know, a significantly higher return than just sort of shooting it out to people. Um, but again, you know, this is sort of a function of all the feedback we've heard to date and we want to keep hearing feedback. But, you know, people have told us they might be, you know, a small subset might be interested in a at least a small subset might be interested in sort of a token to ride out the crypto winner. And, you know, the other the other po points I mentioned at the top end of the, the top of the call, which I won't repeat here. So got it. Got it. If I can just one more quick question, I don't want to hog the mic, but something came up with the Voyager uh, case that it, it's maybe unlikely to happen, but it's something that should be considered mm -hmm. given that this uh, process is taking a lot longer than all of us had hoped. Um, since the claims are dollarized, um, and that's typical for Chapter 11, um, but this is not, you know, typical Chapter 11. We're not just creditors like vendors, so we have actual assets that, you know, we're creditors of. If it's dollarized, there is a scenario where if crypto doubled, uh, which, you know, is, is a possibility over, you know, the coming six months that we're going to be in this process, um, potentially, let's say Bitcoin went, you know, from $20,000 dollarized at the time of Chapter 11, to 40,000, now you can, you know, Celsius can claim that, you know, uh, getting f a half of Bitcoin back uh, at 40,000 would, you know, make people whole in a dollarized sense. Yeah. How do we protect against a scenario like that, you know, assuming, uh, uh, you know, the, the coins are considered ours? Uh, yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I, I think this is this is kind of one of the main topics that we're continuing to kind of work through is what are the different permutations by where values go and how that affects what people get um, to kind of understand that. So I wish I could give you a more specific answer, but it's something we're kind of we're trying to unpack uh, right now, real time. So, um, but Joe, I, I appreciate you raising your hand. I'm going to thank you the next person here, but thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so uh, next, why don't we do, um, uh, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to find people that might not have been called on much um, in the uh, the past. Uh, Victor uh, Ubirna, I'll call you. I apologize if I mispronounced your last name, Victor, but why don't you ask your question? <clears throat> Victor, you're on the stage, so why don't you introduce yourself and ask your question? Good morning. Good night. I'm Victor. I have uh, two questions. The first question is is uh, is about the uh, Celsius Network US entity. One of the things that the uh, examiner says 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 in her report is that the US entity Celsius Network US may have been insolvent since the very beginning, since its inception. So my first question is, what are the the legal consequences of that if Celsius US was insolvent since the beginning. Um, thanks, Victor. I mean, a, one important legal consequence of Celsius being insolvent is that uh, there could be a number of transfers that are deemed to be constructive fraudulent transfers. Um, and that means that um, the entity either was a transferee or a transferor and gave more value uh, than otherwise would have been received while it was insolvent. Um, you know, that may have implications for the, uh, I think the preferred equity holders called it the migration of, of user assets from uh, UK to LLC. Uh, it may also have implications for uh, what Celsius Network LLC can receive back from other folks. But that's certainly one of the main things uh, that comes to my mind when someone talks about solvency and you're looking at a bankrupt company is, is what amount of transfers would be open to being recovered as constructive fraudulent transfers prior to the petition date. Okay, thank you, Aaron. And then the second question, my last question, is regarding sell. One of the 
of the main topics in in the future in in any plan or in any rework maybe maybe cell and a lot of litigation regarding cell might be possible uh, now we thanks to the examiner's report we know that cell price was manipulated but by celsius that celsius bought cell using using customers btc and ETH, and also that that uh, some employees think that cell is worth zero zero dollars uh, however some of the dcc members have a have a lot of have a lot of cell a big position in in cell so this raises questions among, among the community if they are if they still have a fiduciary duty or they have a conflict of interest. Have you guys have you guys studied that? Thank you. Yeah, and um, I think what uh, what you're referencing is uh, Tom, our, our co-chair, who's here today, and you know, um, I'll let Tom speak up for himself too. But just to sort of give a little bit of context here, um, you know, we put out a disclosure called a Rule 2019 statement early in the case that laid out to a dollar. Or to a piece, or to a coin, how much um, each of the members had, and you were right. Some members of our committee do have cell exposure. That said, you know, frankly, against um, probably their own personal self-interest, but as as a good, excellent fiduciary and um, person looking out for the interest, or a committee looking out for the interest of all um, account holders, you know, the committee has taken a really careful look at sell and even before like i alluded to in court last week even before um the report came out you know we had significant concerns about sell and the possibility that sell might be in the same class as other earn or might receive like a same treatment so um we're now studying the examiner's report but you know the own the the, the members of the committee are fiduciaries for everybody that's in the user base and we expect all the members will continue to to think about that as their primary guiding light as we move forward here and um you know like i said we expect that there's going to be really hard questions that need to get answered about cell and you know we don't think it's out of the question for cell to be treated in a different way or face other kind of legal issues as a result of what the examiner said which you know we are continuing to look at so and i guess one other one other point victor you know, our committee members are not only cell holders, they are earn holders, they are loan holders, they have amounts in custody. They, you know, it, the U.S. trustee selected a very broad range. And I believe we filed our bylaws on the docket, uh, which have rules about when people that have conflicts of interest have to abstain to avoid the very um, thing that you're mentioning here. Um, you know, our committee members have all devoted uh, extreme amount of their own personal time uncompensated to really push this forward. And I can't stress for you guys enough how much they have invested in this process and are invested in this process to really bring it to a good result. You know, we spend hours every week talking to them, keeping them informed. They're extremely intelligent people. Uh, they listen, you know, we've, we've devoted a ton of time to this and none of us take this lightly. Okay, thank you for your answer. Yeah, thanks, Victor. Um, so, um, uh, let's just go to the next, uh, uh, let's go to the next uh, person here. Um, Crypto YOLO, the purple owl, I'm gonna call on you. Um, all right, Crypto Yolo, you're on. Why don't you introduce yourself and ask your question when you're ready? Hi, uh, I'm a an earn primarily creditor and a little bit in custody. Um, so I guess you've answered a number of the questions, but um, I'd like to ask about the UCC plan since you're going to oppose uh, the extension of exclusivity. How are you developing that plan? Uh, you know, is Corella? Uh, soliciting investors outside of the marketing process that's already, uh, you know, taken place. Um, but exactly, can you help us understand how the UCC developed plan might differ from what K&E described um, in its filings and in court? 
Yeah, I, I talked a lot about this at the front end of the call. So I, um, you know, if people missed it, I encourage you to, to hear the recording later on, but just to hit a few of the highlights. Uh, our position on exclusivity is that the hearing's on the 15th. That's when exclusivity expires. The debtor has to come to terms with what we want or not. And if they don't, you know, we're ready to, to move on in a different direction. Um, but to date, you know, like we said in court, um, we've been trying to find a, a path that is consensual between both parties. As to what that path is, um, yes, Perella actively went out and tried to find people that might be interested in investing in the crypto business, in the mining, in the loans, any mix of them. And uh, if they were interested, we then brought them into the diligence process with Centerview and they, um, some of them, you know, made proposals or tried to make proposals. Um, but we're very much trying to find, uh, we're, we're looking everywhere we can and Perella is not sitting idly by, they're actively out in the market trying to find people to bring into the process and make there be more options available. So, um, you know, and like I said, uh, the committee, um, you know, has put a lot of work into making that process succeed and we want to see it succeed. Um, and we want to be in the best position to find an investor outside of the company and management and the founders who can stroke uh, what will probably be a significant check to make this all work, whether it's a reorganization of the whole thing or some subset of the different business lines. So. Okay, thanks, Greg. Um, and then um, I guess a couple of comments. One, I agree with uh, what Joe said is that, you know, basically, you know, in that non-convenience class, that there can be some component of liquid crypto included as well as a token in the overall recovery code. I think that that would be more attractive <laughs> to a lot of holders. Um, and then <laughs> secondly, I think you're being unfair to Tiffany on this leak. Because, um, you know, K&E in court uh, said that the sale auction process basically had ended uh, and that no compelling bids were received and that they'd been totally rejected. And she had withheld, you know, the story until that point. And to say that she's profiting off it is kind of rich, right? Because while Tom and, and Scott are volunteers, and I appreciate all their time and all the UCCs, you know, K&E and, and, and uh, White and Case, you guys are going to bill hundreds of millions of dollars, literally, on this case. So, you know, I, I, I just think that's a cheap shot. And if you want to blame anybody, um, you know, for having those plans leaked, it's because of the lack of transparency that K&E and White and Case have really provided to All the right. community. Yeah, I, I, look, I, I, we made statements on this up front, but just to be brief. Um, we're investigating how the leak happened. We have significant concern that a potential investor that was involved in the process might be trying to manipulate it for their own benefit. Um, we're going to get to the bottom of it. And um, the fact of the matter is she's trying to elevate her status here and um, using her paywall to using this whole ep episode to increase awareness of her paywall site. So we think it's really horrible that the documents were leaked. We think it's unfortunate that it is no doubt going to affect rec recoveries. And it was totally unnecessary. And by publicizing it, she kind of lost track of the fact that perhaps what we were saying in court was directed at the bidders we are talking to, to get them to put a better bid forward. That's how this process works. We're trying to pit people against each other. So... Um, I, I know all about competitive tension. Okay, great. And the way it was presented in court was not that. It was that the auction process is over, it failed, and we're moving on to our own reorg. And yes, there is an outside third party that's involved. So it was not presented by that, that way at all by k and &E in court. So I, I, I disagree with that. And, I, and honestly, I think that the, the bottom line here. Is and I don't doubt that that one of the bidders could have potentially leaked it or somebody inside, but that's where the culpability is right. on the leaker, not on the journalist. All right, listen, um, you're entitled uh, to your own opinions, but not your own facts. Um, we're just going to leave it at that. Uh, the leak is not good for creditors. In the case, we're trying to mitigate the effect of it as we try to find a different path. And uh, as I said in court, the recovery co was not a done deal. We're actively looking at other options. Um, because we have not yet chosen and not yet signed something with any party. So um, with that, I'll recognize um, 
uh, Tom Koss, Eco RN Sovereign guy. So, Tom, why don't you introduce yourself when you're ready and uh, ask your question? Yeah, Tom Koss here. Um, I'm the person that heads up the telegram on um, the forced liquidations between the time of the uh, pausing transactions and actually filing Chapter 11. Um, not it doesn't affect me personally as much as my daughter. So where does the UCC sit on on the issue of those forced liquidations from June 12th to July 12th? Or is that beyond the scope of the UCC? No, it's, it's definitely not. You know, I mean, Tom, who's on stage, was affected by it. He had a forced liquidation on May 27th of his... Uh, his uh his loan um one of his loans so it's something that we're thinking about it's sort of embedded and i, I apologize i don't know if i said this to you or a different loan liquidation party the other day you know this is an issue that we're looking at as part of the whole situation um and it's sort of embedded in what happens with loans that weren't liquidated um but it's something we're you know actively trying to to figure out here as part of the, the holistic process. Oh, perfect. So that's part of the the whole loan discussion that includes those those liquidations. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. I mean, look, I, I can't tell you what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen, but it's something that we are given a lot of thought to and consideration to here. So. Yeah, don't get me wrong. This is the, this is a goat rodeo of goat rodeos. So I, I appreciate everything you guys are doing. So thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Tom. All right. Um, victims of Celsius, I'm going to recognize you. All right. Why don't uh, C Dell 382 Kurt, victims of Celsius, why don't you ask your question? All right. Um, maybe we lost this person. Um, all right, Alan Walton, Alan Third. So, Alan, you're now on stage. Why don't you ask your question when you're ready? Alan, can you hear us? Can you ask your question? Oh, uh, sorry, I knew the spaces thing and my mic was muted. No problem. So, uh, looks like some of this custody stuff's been wrapped up, uh, or on the verge of getting wrapped up stuff under 7,575, I think. And then the pure custody. Um, but what about those of us that had like, say just over that amount? So let's say $8,000, where do things currently stand? What's the timeline? Um, that's been ruled our, our property, I believe, but I don't really understand where to go from here. I understand the preferential stuff might happen later on down the line. I know you guys addressed the people who withdrew who had, you know, high net worth people. But what about those of us that are just over that line? What's the play? So with respect to those under the line, um, I expect that the schedule will be published imminently. And I know you've heard that for some time, but we've been continually pushing the debtors to get it out, get it out, get it out. You know, that's been a daily email um, for those over. Um, we're talking with the ad hoc groups right now about what an appropriate um, schedule is for that litigation to do the test cases. Um, and also, you know, we're, we're considering whether there's a consensual resolution to be had. I think to the extent there is a consensual resolution to be had, it could be done um, with a distribution prior to any plan. It could also be done as part of a plan. So I'm sorry, I don't have a, a more definite answer for you, but I, I think that it's subject to some kind of further negotiation in the, the ad hoc groups. You know, they've stepped up and been representing the custody holders in that. And so we've been talking to them with respect to those uh, those points. Got it. And so for those of us not in the ad hoc group, uh, we'll find out about this somehow. Um, yes, to the as I said before, you know, as you know, one of our points is the UCC is if there is any consensual resolution, uh, we think it should be open to everybody. Um, right. And to the extent that there is litigation, um, that will all be published on the docket um, so that everyone can know the path forward in that regard. Okay, perfect. Thank you. 
Thanks, Alan. Um, all right. Uh, before we go to the next speaker, um, Rob Christensen, who's been active in these things in the past, asked um, us to address this whole issue with the Voyager proof of claim. Um, long story short is Celsius appears to have a $7.7 million preference claim. So that's a claim for uh, that it has against Voyager. Voyager uh, had a bar date that required proofs of claim to be filed by a certain date. Celsius didn't file it by that date. Um, the committee is very frustrated by this. We expected it to have been filed. You know, from the second we realized it wasn't filed, we started raising alarm bells to get the situation rectified. Um, we took a number of steps in that regard, including working with Aiken Gump, who's the conflicts counsel for Celsius on the issue. And, um, and um, you know, unfortunately, uh, Judge Wiles, for the time being, has ruled against us. Um, the committee is considering all of its options for how it can rectify the situation, including whether it makes sense to go back to Judge Wiles and ask again, or whether there's a compensation that any of the case parties might be able to provide for this. So we're trying to figure out who's whose um, responsibility this is and be able to try to find a path forward. So um, with that, you know, um, that's, uh, we just want to give that update to the people because Rob was uh, very focused on that and asked us to raise that. Um, all right, uh, I'll, I'll uh, call on someone new here, uh, Ron Paul Bot one, two, three, four. Ron Paul bot one two three four. Um, when you're ready, ask your question. Hello, thank you for bringing me up. Uh, I'm a creditor uh, on I think the Covina class. I'm representing my family, so I have around two thousand claims um, as time of the filing. But uh, I've talked with a lot of people, and I wanted to bring some points. I'm no, sh I don't have any shares on any competing bid or. Uh, when I, I think initially you brought up, I think uh, one of the first town halls that you guys were looking at a potential callback of the tether uh, loan. Do you think there is any standing for that, um, or you you think he is MD a secure lender and uh, creditors have no claims over that uh, liquidated BTC that happened? I'm sorry. So this is a question about the. The people whose loans were liquidated. What no, no, no. The, the, no. There was a the uh, oh, the had a, oh. a one billion eight hundred and sixty one million. Yeah, okay. I, I apologize. Loan. Um, yeah. So look, we've said uh, for a while the tether loan, and that's and if, actually the the true quantum of the tether loan looks like it was previously understated. Uh, the examiner has some new information that we're looking at in terms of how big that is. Um, Tether, like all other parties, institutional parties in particular, that may have engaged in, you know, liquidations or things like that or other acts to kind of put themselves ahead of everybody else. Um, we don't we expect that they won't get released. They'll have to have their conduct investigated by the litigation trust and they should be carefully, you know, uh, those claims should be pursued if they're if they're feasible. Um, I appreciate there's a lot of desire for people to start suing lots of people during the bankruptcy case, you know, to date. We've tried pushing as much of that litigation to the post-bankruptcy period to save time and money, but you know we're continuing to assess that with respect to all parties, if it makes sense. Uh, anything during the thank you, thank you. That, that's, that's good. Uh, another question um, about the sale token. Uh, I think most of the sale is is on the app, and you can have a selection of the insiders. And I think with the examiner report, we kind of know that. 400 or 500 million were spent and uh, since uh, the beginning on purchasing of sell token. Uh, and I do agree, as mentioned before, that $1 in sell is not $1 on, crypt on BTC or Ethereum. So have you guys studied about providing a sort of loyal loyalty uh, program for maybe service uh, that service could happen? Has then been studied. Like uh, you guys, briefly touch on that, 
uh, or are you just going to to, to see it as a, a dollar claim? I, I mean, I'll just kind of re revert to what we said earlier about sell. Um, we had a lot of questions about sell. Um, the examiner's report has vindicated a lot of those questions and provided a lot of answers. Um, we're evaluating what's going to happen with sell. I would expect that it is going to have a different treatment in light of the findings that the examiner made. Um, and, you know, that's going to be something that I expect a chapter 11 plan would have to take into account all those findings about how it was manipulated because um, that affects the, the value of those tokens. I'm not referring exactly to sell as a coin, but using, because you know whoever had sell, mm -hmm. if you could do some sort of uh, new to token without insider's involvement uh, and under a new reorg, or if you might look at that on a chapter 11 plan. Because I think that would seem, would seem probably the most fair situation. So you don't want to give one to one dollar. Um, and you probably, this is based also in the success of the company. Uh, and besides I hope that, I'm understanding you right, Ron. I, I assume that's not your name, but I guess I'll, I'll refer to it. Your, your idea is to create a new token and give that new token to sell holders, um, you know, and whatever that token. Yeah, yeah, the, the issue here, like most of the sell is on on the Celsius app. You know exactly who has uh, what and uh, uh, who are the insiders. So you basically could just create a new token under a new um revenue model a new company model which i think is seems to be custody and you could simply simply assign that uh, that sell uh, to the that's that new token tied to the sell uh, holdings that non insiders previously had so that could be a way for you to prevent a dollar conversion and uh, maybe uh, move the 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 investment that people deposit on the the company and this new co instead of just uh, being a, a pure um, dollarized claim. Uh, uh, although maybe issues could could uh, arise from equitable distribution, but uh, it's, it's, it's illiquid. Uh, that, that's the main issue. Okay. Uh, but, we'll definitely definitely we have any comment? your suggestion, and, and you know, we'll take it into consideration. Okay. Uh, j j just to finish... Um, just a, a little comment. I think what I see that's lacking from the Celsius is uh, maybe some sort of information portraying the, the value that Celsius currently has. Like some people don't even know that there is 62% of coins uh, on the platform. So maybe on the next on holes, you can mention the current, uh, the current standing uh, and what, cel uh, what Celsius creditors could have potentially. This is what the company has. Um, and besides that, do you intend on uh, having some sort of locking period? It's like, at least on previous bankruptcies that I've seen, you usually uh, offer a haircut uh, for those people that want to leave, and then uh, you convert the debt on sort of, um, some sort of equity and you, and as you, so if there is 60% of the coins, uh, you offer a 60% a, a haircut, so people leave with 40% crypto, but they get their funds immediately. And because there is a net uh, profit on the assets that Celsius hold, the ones that stay longer are benefit, are benefit by that uh, for those people walking away, walking away. Is that, is that fair in this? Uh, does that happen in this sort of uh, um, bankruptcy or this touches on fair uh, equitable distribution? Would you maybe highlight the situation? Well, you know, there's a lot to unpack there. <clears throat> I think, um, so I appreciate you raising the point. Um, we just, we, we hit a lot of this earlier, but, you know, yes, we are interested in the concept where people get equity or tokens or coins or some other kind of consideration for their claims and mixing and matching things like that. And um, that's totally part of what we're, we're considering here. So I appreciate you raising the question today. Um, all right. Next person I'm going to recognize is Tecmo SB. Tecmo, if you want to ask your question.
Hi, Tecmo, you're on stage if you can ask your question. All right, Tecmo, if you uh, come back, we'll try to call you. All right, uh, Crypto Miami One. Crypto Miami One, why don't you introduce yourself and ask your question? Crypto Miami One, please ask your question. Yeah, thanks, sir. Uh, thanks for taking uh, my question. This is Michael. Uh, I'm a member of both uh, the loans uh, and the uh, earn ad hoc groups. So I just want to riff a little bit on um, the debtor's plan, what they discussed in court about the asset share token. And since we probably maybe at least, you know, one of the first bankruptcies or first crypto bankruptcies that's using this asset share token as a model uh, for relief, I just, I want to just, if you don't mind me speculating a bit here, I just to highlight a couple points. So there's really only three apps currently that use uh, secure, security tokens uh, that you can sort of uh, put on an app and buy and sell uh, your share. Uh, the three ones are Securitize, uh, INX, and uh uh, T0. So I went down the rabbit hole and just sort of tried to figure out as a crypto using person, what's it like to use these apps and what are just some of the pitfalls that I, I see that could happen if we get one of these security tokens. First of all, uh, you do have to KYC to enter the app, which is absolutely fine. We're all used to doing a KYC. Um, if you need to go to the next level, you actually need to prove that you're an accredited investor because some of the this, this share tokens that are on these apps, and they're all, all three of them are extremely similar. Uh, some of the share tokens are for non-accredited U.S. investors, and some are for accredited investors. So it's something to keep in mind since this is going to be, if this does work in the asset share model, and this is like a multi-billion dollar, you know, uh, secondary market token, they may require uh, accredited investors to be able to sell your token. And um, many of the people of the 500,000 people that would be in the convenience class would not be accredited investors. So I think it's just something to look into um, with, a, with a potential buyer, because I think that's an important issue for people who need to exit, um, that they may, they may not be accredited investors to be able to post their token uh, for sale. And then the second thing is like, I think everyone, you know, I mean, just like crypto is kind of a novel technology. If you haven't used it before and you're in bankruptcy court, um, and you got to get a little experience with it. I think it's the same thing with this asset share token model for crypto users. It's extremely easy. You basically log in and it looks like a crypto exchange. It's basically an order book and it's peer to peer selling of your security token in a peer to peer model with an order book. And then it's just my final point and my final concern is that, you know, what I've seen as I've gone into all three of these apps now, and you know, most of these IPOs, whether it's the primary market sale of a security or secondary market, which is what we would be, they're fairly small, like, you know, tens of millions. I don't think I saw anything over a hundred million. They're relatively small, not like a hundred, you know, not like a multi-billion dollar uh, market cap like we would be what i'm mostly concerned about would be that you would have you know thousands of celsians trying to sell security tokens on an app it seems to be a fairly e-liquid mark e-liquid peer-to-peer market and and the, i just see pr a, a total price gouging you know almost like a uh 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 you know, 10 cents on the dollar kind of thing. So I, I just want to, again, and I'm sure this has been thought about already, but like just at least having a lender of last resort, you know, uh, on this kind of a token launch, because uh, it, this seems to be a fairly illiquid market. And I, I, and I understand that the, whoever this buyer is maybe launching this, you know, a, a totally new app with a huge new market push. But, you know, as it stands now, I think everyone trying to understand this model of an asset share token should at least log on to one of these apps just to get some experience with it and bring up, you know, some of, some of the issues that, that, that I found just going through cursory. Thanks. Thank you. No, that's kind of the, the value of the share token out the gate is top of mind for us. Um, you know, those, those concerns are not, are not new, nor are they things that we haven't thought of or are thinking about. That's kind of, one of one of the the primary considerations we are discussing when we're talking about that term, sort of plan. Okay. Um, all right. We appreciate the uh, 
question here when we uh a second here um let's get uh all right so i see simon dixon raised his hand i'll recognize him all right simon you're on stage why don't you ask your question uh hey greg and uh, team um the the security token sides have if it hasn't been put past regulators right now, last time we got a security token approved, um, it took approximately nine months but to get the SEC to sign off. And that was in a non-hostile environment. Um, I know that the sponsor is due to be regulated, but um, the, I imagine that if this is going to be a public reporting company, then the SEC is going to have to approve the offering um, do you have an indication of whether there's going to be some kind of fast track to that process? And also, um, the regulators are very hostile towards security tokens. They might be more friendly towards something that doesn't have a token in it. Um, so, And the, the liquidity benefit just isn't there with security tokens. It, it doesn't exist at the moment. Um, there's a liquidity discount. It's normally about 75% discounted when you tokenize versus non-tokenization. Um, I, I really, really want to stress the importance of um, getting some experience rather than just a platform um, that, that knows how to structure these security tokens because they, they can go. And, and my fear is that the regulators will have a, will have a deep concern about the, the crashing, the race to sell, uh, and and various other things, and so um, please yeah. make sure that we uh, we understand the length of time that this will take, and if there is some kind of fast track from a regulator, is this feasible, or is this just Celsius going to buy another year and this through this process? Yeah, that's a, thank you for the questions, <clears throat> uh, Simon. So, um, in terms of a, a fast track, uh, no. There is, as far as I'm aware, there's no assurance that there will be a fast track. The SEC and some other regulators have been contacted about the concept that we've been discussing and have started to provide feedback. Um, but, you know, one of the reasons that we haven't signed off on that or, or any other topic yet is we want to make sure the company has enough liquidity to get to the end. Um, the company really kind of runs out of money, you know, in... Um, june around then so they don't have a year to do this so if this isn't feasible you know in the next uh few if we don't think it is going to be feasible in like a couple of months time frame then you know that's going to be very relevant to uh how we think about um doing this um but you know i also want to just flag for people um some of the security offering mechanics here are going to be a little bit different than what you might have seen in other circumstances and the reason is um there's a provision of the bankruptcy code called Section 1145 that lets you issue securities, which probably includes tokens, on account of debt more readily. Um, that doesn't solve sort of the public reporting issues that would be attendant after the bankruptcy and after those uh, tokens are issued. But um, So we have a little bit of flexibility that doesn't exist there otherwise, but the SEC and others are still going to be part of the conversation. We need to make sure they're okay with it. Um, all right. So... Um, We've been here for an hour and 40 minutes, you know, so we'll probably do another 20 minutes or so and then um, call it a day. We have other stuff here to, to focus on. Um, all right. So next person I'm going to call on is JK. Seriously, JK. All right. Um, you're on stage now. Why don't you ask your question? Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm pretty, uh, I, I fall into every category. Um, one of the big problems with me is I sent both more crypto and I wired in cash during the freeze period. Um, I wasn't getting any contact from anybody other than say I can wire something in. So I'm curious what's going to happen with those things. Can I claim them? Um, Cause I literally sent in six figures of cash. Um, and, uh, you know, should that be claimed and when is the fi final date for claiming for that kind of stuff? And that's, I mean, the fact that there was no contact for that kind of stuff 
um, or responses, I should say. Um, you know, I, I sent in the money, I sent in the crypto, you know, um, and yeah. And when I did that, they paid off, it looked like uh, potentially they paid off the, or they closed the loans. But if they're closed, what is it actually releasing of my crypto if that crypto doesn't exist? So what did I pay for and why? Um, I, I might, <clears throat> let me, there's a lot to unpack there, but the bar date was extended for February 9th. Um, I can't give you legal advice about your claim, but you'd probably be wise to file a proof of claim for all of that which I suspect is I, not. I, I, don't, I don't want advice. I'm just curious, like what, what would be, yeah, I think you should file a proof. I would file a proof of claim if I were in your shoes and try to, to, to make sure that's all captured by the claim process. Um, so uh, we'd recommend you do that. Um, and then Aaron, anything you want to add on his other. What does that, questions? does that mean my claim for, um, for those loans closing? Does that mean those, uh, that that crypto is is technically in my account um i do see it i just want to make sure will that eventually be in my account and is that something i can claim and with the cash am i uh, am i claiming that through like withheld uh, withhold because there's absolutely no thing for my scenario i i would probably if i were in your shoes i would file a, an addendum on your proof of claim that lays out all these different components if you don't think they fit onto the sheet okay yeah there's no box there's no box on the proof of claim form and again we can't we can't provide advice on specific claims or with respect to your specific claim but the you can always attach a description on the back of the claim that describes what happens to you i would encourage you to include all evidence that you have because that will help the claims process proceed and it will avoid the ability for people to come back to you asking for more information, which may take quite a bit of time. So the more information you include with your proof of claim form, the easier it will be for whoever is sorting out those claim form to determine what your claim against the estate is. Okay. Are the, is the freeze period going to be addressed in any real detail in this, in this whole process? Because if it's not, that's what I'm worried about. Because a lot of stuff happened during the freeze. Uh, you're absolutely right. A lot of things happen during the freeze. Um, you know, at bankruptcy, the dividing line is the petition date. Um, you know, I think that there is a, uh, the freeze is certainly something that's unique to Celsius' bankruptcy and something that we'll have to kind of consider as we move through this. But, you know, when you file bankruptcy and whether something is a pre-petition claim or a post-petition claim is based off of the petition date. Okay. All right. Thanks. 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 Um, all right. Next, I'm going to call uh, Andy. Andy C. S. C. E. Uh, sorry. All right, uh, Andy, you're you're on. Um, why don't you ask your question? Andy, you're on stage. Please ask your question. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm probably a little bit behind and maybe all this has been already kind of, uh, talked about and, and answered prior, but forgive me if it has, um, I, I had just a couple of questions about, you know, being part of the earn program, uh, and how the judge basically deemed the coins to be a property of Celsius, um, and moving forward with either the, the new co or whatever, uh, entity, or or however any distribution happens is is the is, are the people in the earn program uh still eligible to receive a, anything or or does are they deemed to be kind of zeroed out but no the the that the when the judge determines that the coins are property of the estate it doesn't mean that celsius doesn't have to pay back its obligations it just means that those assets are available to pay back all of its obligations. So as an earned creditor, you still have a claim against the estate mm -hmm. for the value of your earned claim. And under a plan, you'll receive a treatment, which will give you consideration, whether it be in crypto dollars, you know, these are just used as sure. examples, but it will be uh, an amount that will be based off of the pro rata distribution to all earned claimants or all similarly situated claimants. And so 
you know, say there's uh, the total amount in the estate is 50 and there's 100 people with claims, each of those people would get 50 cents, right? right? That's kind of how, how it worked. And it spread radically amongst similarly situated creditors. Okay. And um, just second on, on being part of the EARN program and this, you know, I, I wrote this in my... Uh, in my claim that I submitted. Um, and, and it was really part of the fact that, you know, I was sort of grandfathered into the earn program after they sort of made it a, a accredited investor only program. And so being grandfathered into that, um, essentially almost made me an accredited investor. I, even though I wasn't, and, and maybe it doesn't actually do that, but you know, it, it puts me in the same playing field as somebody who was an accredited investor. And in a sense, you know, either, uh, do we get, could we get treatment as people who were accredited or could we in some way get treatment, uh, that like those who were grandfathered in and who were not accredited, uh, in, in some way sort of, uh, protected against the, the, I, in a sense, the non legal part of, of us not being accredited and still being part of a program that required people to be accredited. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm not sure. I, I think I, I might understand it. And the, the, I guess the answer I would give is under the bankruptcy code, when you're constructing a plan, you create classes of creditors yeah. and all similarly situated creditors have to be classified in the same class. Mm -hmm. There are exceptions to that. So there are, um, you know, you can create a convenience class, for instance, for smaller holders to give them a different treatment than larger holders uh, because there's a, a business reason or an equitable reason to do so. Um, you know, some plans uh, in this, I'm not sure if this would be the case in Celsius or not, would create a separate trade class from financial funded debt creditors. Even though they're unsecured claims, the thought is that they have a different interest in the entity and so they can get a different treatment. But here, I think as an earned creditor, you would have a similarly situated claim with respect to all earned creditors. And I think the, the correct answer there would be that all earned creditors would receive the same treatment. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Right. Um, yeah, we probably have time here for uh, one more uh question before going into that you know we've been getting a lot of offline feedback about this whole leak business um look we we'll just keep it simple the bidding process in our view remains open um we are continuing to talk to multiple parties um whether the information that came out was accurate or not it is interrupting that process um you know we're disappointed that it was released we hope that there aren't further leaks and, but at the same time, we are very cognizant. Creditors have a right to know what's going on. You know, we are trying to balance those desires with, um, you know, the need to sort of play bidders off of each other and investors off of each other. Um, and we want to bring this process to a close as quickly as possible and get last dollar for the account holders. I, I might add, though, you know, even of the parties that were identified in the leak, if Celsius were to approach them, the leak now having happened, their ability to engage with them will be more limited. So, um, I, you know, I, I want to just make a couple of those comments, given all the offline feedback that we got today. Um, but with that, why don't we try to wrap uh, this up? And um, I'll ask, I'll, I'll recognize uh, one more person here. Uh, Manny, I'll recognize you. So Manny Main, you're on. Why don't you ask your question when you're ready? Manny, if you're there, why don't you ask your question? All right. Manny, you know where to find us if you want to ask us anything. Um, all right. Uh, going down the list here, see if there's anyone that we haven't really called on um, in the uh, recent um, in the recent past. Um, all right. So uh, 
victims of Celsius, you're back. I, I tried calling on you earlier. I'll call on you again. All right. Uh, so victims of Celsius, um, why don't you ask your question? Victims of Celsius, are you there? Why don't you ask your question? Uh, thanks for having me, uh, Kurt. Sure. I'm an earned customer. And I have a, a couple questions. Um, considering what the report came out today and uh, talked about the activities of insiders, uh, and even at this point, they have not submitted a plan, but we're all able to see that they get $40,000 a month salaries. Is there any action that the UCC can take now to, to put an end to that because they're not, they are not doing their job. They haven't brought a plan. They uh, appear to be stalling at every situation. Now the insiders have been basically outed and the people running the show now were appointed by the insiders. So uh, I guess my question is, is there any action that you guys can take now with this information in hand that can either control that, curtail that, remove people, put people in that would do a better job and would serve creditors better. And I have um, another question yeah. regarding the sell token. Yeah, look, um, if anyone's at Celsius right now drawing a salary, um, it's because we don't think that they, you know, it's because we've investigated them and companies investigated them and they haven't done bad acts that would have warrant them being removed as for people that were there previously. Yeah, that's great. I'll just add that, that that's ongoing, right? This is not that, that it's all happened, but, you know, based off of the independent findings that we just received at one in the morning last night, you know, we're going to take a hard look at all of this as I'm sure the debtors will too. Yep. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, and in regarding the sell token, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure you guys are very uh, aware of its uh, controversy. Sure. Um, I had I did somebody come up a few few ago and was asking about its reincarnation and issuing another token that even the ones not locked up in the app could have for some kind of utility. I, I certainly hope that the transparency in that is pretty sure. Uh, you know, it's very singular. It's, it's always a, a certain group that is pushing for it for their own purposes. And I think it's, it's in everybody's interest and the entire process's interest that we take, you know, hopefully we go away and distance ourselves from the cell token. It's so much controversy and so much drama. I feel like it's really taking away from the process. And I hope that the UCC uh, agrees with that and sees that there is so much controversy surrounding it that it should probably stay away. So I'll, I'll just say we're not going to get into the, the sometimes the debates that happen on Twitter. I, I think the examiner's report with respect to the cell token speaks for itself. There was a lot of manipulation of the token and it was used in extremely improper ways by insiders and that part is not lost on us. I think we've spoken about the sell token a great deal on the spaces and um, you know we don't know what motivates individual people. We know that most people are economic actors and we all uh, have that in mind when we are considering why people do things, especially in a bankruptcy case. You know, one of the fundamental issues in every bankruptcy case is there's not enough to go around for everybody. And so there have to be a relative uh, division lines to determine who gets what and what part of the pie. You know, that's kind of the essence of what the bankruptcy code is all about, is, is creating an equitable distribution based off of the relative rights of creditors. Um, and your points you know, with respect to sell token, I think are made extremely clear uh, by what the examiner found um, with respect to how the company manipulated the price of the token. Thank you. Appreciate it. And just um, in case I, I missed it, just one last last thing. Um, 
did you guys commit to not ex- extending exclusivity? Yeah, we, we've dealt with that a bit earlier today. So um, in the interest of time here, we're going to re- recommend you uh, listen to the recording. Um, but before we go, um, I think Scott or Tom, uh, I know you had a few things, one or both you wanted to share. So why don't you take the time to do that? I wanted to address the XRP concern that was raised on our last town hall. Uh, and so I'd, I'd reached out and there was um, confirmation from Chris Ferraro that the rate was set to zero because they were concerned it was a security. And then, um, but the it was never moved out of the earn program. And so... I can't remember who the creditor was that had asked about that, but I had confirmed that it was indeed uh, the rate set to zero, but never moved out of the earn program with the expectation. I believe that if, if um, the clarification was ever reached that the rate could, could resume. So I, I hope, um, I hope that information finds you. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, we thank everyone for their time today. Um, We know it's been a very uh, active week here, so we'll look forward to talking to you again soon and reach out with any in particular, reach out with any observations or thoughts you have about the different proposals we discussed, um, especially, you know, the recovery co versus the other option. Um, Again, no decision has been made. We want to get your input. And, um, you know, if you have input about what was put out there at the hearing last week, we would welcome hearing uh, from you soon. All right. Thanks, everybody.